Welcome to the Cyber Distortion Podcast. Tonight, Kevin and Jason have the distinct honor of interviewing one of the co-hosts of the Cybercognition Podcast. The Cybercognition Podcast is co-hosted by Justin Hutchins and Len No. It explores the interplay between humanity and technology, focusing on the challenges and opportunities this relationship presents. Each episode delves into topics at the cutting edge of technology, innovation, and science aiming to understand humanity's evolving role in an increasingly digital world. The hosts discuss the societal, cultural, political, and philosophical implications of emerging technologies, with a particular emphasis on artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and transhumanism. Tonight, join us as the guys interview co-host Justin, also known as Hutch, to get his perspective on this fascinating world. Again, welcome in for tonight's conversation. Enjoy the show. Episode 7. The Socials Boy with Justin Hutchins. Oh, and welcome to the Cyber Distortion Podcast. This is Season 3, Episode 7. Wow, 7 already, Jason? 7. It seems like we've gotten to 7 already. Oh, we're at Uh, 7, buddy. We finally started making some traction this season is the thing. I mean, we got off to a real slow start this year, but... Uh, th- tonight's going to be a good one. We've got a, it's not quite a first because we have had a repeat guest on the podcast in the past, but Hutch is going to be only the second repeat guest on the Cyber Distortion podcast. So that's, that's kind of a, a cool thing about tonight's guest. Um, tonight we're going to be talking in the world again of, uh, in and around AI, uh, Hutch is an AI expert and, specializes in the area of social engineering and hacking in the area of AI and using all kinds of technologies around that. And we'll get into a lot of that tonight. But uh, let's start out with your bio, Hutch. Um, Justin Hutchins, we call you Hutch. <laughs> Justin is a an award-winning speaker, an author, a podcaster. We're going to talk about that too. A teacher, a technologist, a cyber researcher, a data scientist, a full stack developer, and a blogger. You blog out there on your blog called Sociosploit, which can be set, found out on sociosploit.com. Justin po- posts is a post is post is he posts is of the mostest, but he's the postest <laughs> of the mostest. <laughs> Justin posts about all of his projects and a lot of very interesting uh, past projects that he's done. And uh, if you are interested in that kind of thing, get out there. He's got some really cool stuff out there. And as if all of that's not enough, he is also the author of The Language of Deception, Weaponizing Next Generation AI. Now, Hutch has released this book since the last time he was on the podcast, which I believe was episode three and four of last Mm -hmm. season. Uh, back to backer and uh, we'll talk about the book what's in the book what to expect there and why you all need to go out and get yourselves a copy but before we get into uh the first segment here jason i'll let let you uh welcome hutch as well yeah absolutely hutch it is great to have you back you know it's always fun to to when we get together because we always end up talking a lot of shop (laughs) and the conversation (laughs) is always great so I really enjoy that. You know, tonight your co-host Lynn was supposed to be on, but got uh, called away with work duties, which we know always happens. Stupid um, work. Especially in cyber, man. Oh, but <laughs> it is what it is. And we look forward to getting Lynn on here next time as well, right? And sitting in our next episode and sitting in and getting into a deeper conversation with the two of you um, as the co-host of your podcast, which we're going to get into. Uh, but, you know, what I thought would be interesting is as we start to talk to you a little bit more, you know, we had you on episode three and four of season two last year. 
and those were AI discussions. I think it would be great to start with that right now. Like, where are we today? What have you been working on? Right? Where 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 have you gone since then to now? And and then maybe even we can start talking a little bit about your relationship with Lynn and where you guys got started at there. Yeah, for sure. So uh, thank you guys for having me on. Excited to be back on the podcast. Absolutely, man. And um, yeah, Lynn, uh, yeah, like you said, he's currently down under in Australia doing some uh, media stuff. So he uh, sends his apologies. He was he was excited about joining. So he's looking forward to jumping on the next one. But um, yeah, as, as far as things that I've been doing since the, the last time that we met, um, I think that that was kind of shortly after the whole AI boom that took off after the the release of chat gpt and once the the world started paying attention again and so obviously been capitalizing on some of the the research that i had been doing prior to the release of chat gpt and it once the world started paying attention it, it seemed like a good time to continue to further invest in that area um on the professional side i kind of took refocused from specifically cybersecurity to a broader focus across all of enterprise technology. I took a role in our innovation team where uh, with my current employer at Trace3. And in that role, we are kind of looking at emerging technology across the spectrum, uh, all the way from cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, data analytics, cloud, DevOps, and it's, it's really exciting constantly seeing kind of the bleeding edge and what is coming out of that new technology space. Um, yeah. As far as the, the podcast, so that is definitely a new thing that we've started since the last time that we talked. So we, I originally started the podcast with the intention of it being mostly focused on artificial intelligence. I had a few guests on in the early episodes and Lynn was actually one of the early guests that I had on the show. And I've known Lynn for a while. He actually had been a, I met him originally when he was a previous guest on a podcast that I had hosted in the past for a previous employer and uh, found out about all of the the cool and exciting stuff that he does. So he's a transhuman biohacker. He has multiple different, I think at this point he's at 10 different implants in various different wow. locations in his hands and arms. And each one does different things from RFID, NFC. Um, so uh, all, all different types of radio signals and stuff. And, and he's actually devised a number of different hacking techniques where he can just hold your <laughs> cell course, phone right? for a, a <laughs> few seconds and can take over your cell phone. Um, obviously, with the uh, wave of a hand, he note. can open doors. Mental and, note, Jason. <laughs> Yep. So, Since we'll be uh, so seeing crazy. Lynn here in a few weeks. Yeah. Yep. Crazy stuff. Um, and actually, uh, I, I think we're going to be talking a little bit later about uh, DEF CON and Black Hat coming up. Um, one of the interesting things about Lynn is because he does have all of that technology in his hands, one of the things that he has to do is he actually has to uh, protect himself from attacks against his own ship. Absolutely. So he's created his own custom Faraday mm -hmm. gauge gloves that he wears to those events. Um, wow. But uh, one of the things that I, we've always connected over is he is obviously very bleeding edge technology enthusiast so uh very fascinated by kind of the the latest and greatest the stuff that's certainly far beyond being or a ways off from being adopted by the mainstream and has an interest in kind of that future perspective of what do we think the trends are going to be in five ten years and so after the conversation that i had with him it's we connected really well. I thought the conversation went great. And so I, I thought it'd be interesting to kind of recraft that podcast to have a more broader futurist perspective, just kind of looking broadly at the bleeding edge technology and what is kind of the latest advances across all the technology space. So looking at stuff like transhumanism, but also artificial intelligence, even things like kind of genetic engineering and other stuff that's on the bleeding edge. So uh, that is kind of that whole area of futurism and looking at emerging technology trends is really the focus of that podcast, uh, which we call cyber cognition. Yeah. Uh, very awesome. cool. Very cool. Yeah. Cyber cognition podcast uh, for the listeners who don't know about it, go check it out. Um, I've listened to several of your episodes. It was uh, last season when you were on with us and you told us about Lynn 
in our discussion around AI that I started kind of looking for interviews with them and trying to kind of dig a little deeper on, because when you said the embedded chips and about five in each arm, and I've read a bunch of his or heard a bunch of his interviews where he says, yeah, I've got 10 between each elbow and wrist on, across both arms, and, and he's looking to do some new stuff, which he, we'll, we'll have him talk about when he comes on. Dude, it's fascinating. Some of the stuff that he can do with that, with just the chip technology is fascinating. Fascinating. And we'll get into some of the other embedded types of technology as well uh, when we get into that episode. But man, it, it's wild. It really is. But so Hutch, definitely a it, different, it's a definitely a different thinking process for our, our audience, right? To dive down a piece of technology that maybe people aren't so familiar with and don't quite fully understand yet and, and to kind of bring awareness to something that is that's happening that's new that has a lot of different uh options associated with it for people to consider when they, when they really are looking at technology and the advancement of technology yeah yeah for sure i don't think uh it, there 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 can't be a large percentage if you did, probably less than yeah. one percent uh, that of people that have even thought about, much less would ever do what Lynn has done. Yeah, and that's what makes it on, all the more interesting. It's not on most people's radar. It's actually probably more than you would think. And I, I know Lynn can actually speak to, he's connected with some of the vendors that provide some of these solutions and can tell you some surprising numbers about how many they've actually sold. But, um, and, and I can't recall those specifics off the top of my head, but well, I, I think it definitely is not on most people's radars. I uh, recently did a visit with a particular three-letter agency to give them a briefing on some of the stuff that I was doing, <laughs> uh, AI hacking. And I kind of brought up the topic of like, I, well, I just told them, I'm like, when I came through here, I, I walked through a, uh, a metal detector, which I know based on conversations with Lynn, when he goes to the airport, he doesn't set off because there's a certain threshold. Uh, of yeah. metal in the body really that is expected based on people that have medical implants and other issues so oh he, wow he can walk right through those and, and i mentioned it to him like it's like this, this could be a very serious cyber threat and you would tell everybody you have to leave your electronics you have to leave your technology at the door well you can just walk in with it in your body and not a one of them had ever even heard of or realized this was a so uh, <laughs> see, see, that's pretty wild. That's pretty wild. And that's the reason it. why we have experts like you and Lynn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Hutch, you've, you've definitely been busy. Um, and, and we, you know, we've got to get into your book here and talk about that a little bit because I want to make sure, uh, everybody listening understands what the book is about, what, what inspired you to write a book in the first place with everything else you've got going on. I can't imagine having a full-time job and doing everything that you do in addition to podcasting to go out and try to, you know, write, publish, edit, and release a book. So um, we've been <laughs> quoting your book already. I think I, we kind of talked about this a little bit, you know, off off the recording that we've been using some of the quotes out of your book in presentations when we do some of these live podcasts. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say one of the quotes because we have this in a slide in one of our presentations and i just found it to be really cool because i never th really thought about it like this but you quoted in your book i think it was even chapter one or two one of the first two chapters by speaking their language humans have hacked machines for decades but now with the machines speaking our language the era when machines will hack humans is upon us i read that i almost got chills when i read it because i'm like oh dude that's freaking good i never thought about it like that but um, that's that's pretty cool when you think about it that way. Not not it can be cool in a good way, but it's also cool in frightening ways <laughs> when you think about that. But um, I guess let's get into the book, man. What, what what inspired you to do this? So I had been playing with artificial intelligence technology for a long time, and uh, in, in various different capacities, uh, professionally had done some kind of risk management around various different model implementations. I also had done a lot of personal stuff in algorithmic trading, but one of the early projects that I did was actually in very early forms of natural language processing, and specifically it was using early rule-based chatbots in order to try to 
automate the process of social engineering and manipulating people. And at the, at this was over a decade ago at this point. And so what, when I say this was really bad chatbot technology, like when you compare it to what we see today, it was pretty terrible. But <laughs> within the right context and used correctly, even then you could already see the early signs of a, a potential threat that at some point was going to mature and develop. So at the time I had created these bots with the intention of harvesting password recovery questions. Of course, 10 years ago, multi-factor authentication wasn't nearly as ubiquitous as it is today. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, you could gain access to someone's personal services and oftentimes even their professional internet services just by being able to answer what street they grew up on or what their high school mascot was or what the first car that they drove was. And so what I had this idea of basically if, if you walk up to a random person and you ask them those questions, it's going to immediately raise red flags. But there's one context in which that's not true. And that's the context in which you're trying to get to know somebody. You're just trying to learn things more about them. And of course, the most obvious candidate for that online was free internet dating sites. So what I did was I created these bots, deployed them on free dating platforms, created kind of an OSINT scraping system that would allow me to identify based on their profile, reused images, reused usernames, other details that were in their profile. It could figure out who they were, who they worked for by cross-referencing that against LinkedIn and doing some Google hacking. And then it would have these automated bots that would start conversations with them. And realistically, if you interacted with these bots for more than probably 10 or 20 different exchanges of messages, you would likely realize that it was a bot that you were communicating with. But in most cases, that was, or I say in most cases, really, it was, it was successful about 5% of the time. So, so not great. But if you have a fully yeah. automated system and there's no human intervention and you can deploy this and have it interacting with thousands of people per day, that's still, over time, the, the matter of a few days, you've already gathered enough credentials to gain access to hundreds of people's different accounts. So again, kind wow. of, it, the, the technology was bad, but even then it was this evidence that if it was possible to automate social interactions, the potential impacts to that could be catastrophic. And of course, then you fast forward to today, uh, and, and and really I started catching on and, and seeing it whenever it was GPT-3, which was the immediate predecessor to ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. And I started, uh, and, and honestly, I don't even remember to this day exactly how I found out about it. Um, but as soon as I saw it, I knew that we were, we had gotten so close, like it was unbelievable how close this technology was to truly interacting with the person. So uh, with the GPT-3 models, I started building out uh, even more kind of autonomous social engineering systems that were tasked with that basically could be deployed on various different internet platforms, chat communications, and would interact with people with very specific objectives of what it was trying to achieve, whether it was pretending to be a help desk person, to try to get their password, or pretending to be a person in the finance department of a, a third party company and trying to get somebody at another company to change the bank account that they were routing their payments out to. Um, even like stuff like social security administration fraud, where it would pretend to be a social security administration personnel and uh, would suggest to them that their information has been compromised. If you can provide all of these details about yourself, we can verify you are who you say you are and we can get you free credit monitoring. Yeah. And uh, so, so yeah, all, all kinds of things that in, and even with GPT three, this was very, it was very capable. Obviously, it continued to get more and more frightening with chat GPT, which is 3.5, now GPT-4. Um, of course, the, the multimodal conversational capabilities of 4.0 are absolutely terrifying, and they still haven't broadly rolled that out. And I think that's largely because even though OpenAI realizes that there's significant potential for risk there. So, um, yeah, I, once chat GPT released and the entire world was suddenly interested in this technology. I figured if there was ever a time to write a book, if there was ever a time when the, the stuff that I was researching was suddenly relevant 
uh, that, <laughs> that now was the time. So I, I buckled down. I knew the very time relevant. Was lesson, so I, <laughs> I basically made a goal for myself of 900 words per day for uh, a period of about five to six months. And wow. Uh, it, yeah, my, and, and so uh, what's the nine? What, what's the nine hundred words? What is that re- representative of? Anything? It was what was nine based on? I you know I set myself a goal of when I wanted to be finished with it, which I think was uh, about five months out from when I started it, and I figured out based on kind of what I had forecasted to my publisher of what I thought the size of the book was going to be, and kind of divided that out across the days, and basically said as long as I am at least have a moving average above nine hundred every single day then i will <laughs> wow. be able to hit that very aggressive mark and so it was uh it was a lot of work but it was worth it it was um i got it out within less than a year of the release of chat gpt and uh nice yeah, the rest is history yeah that's awesome well, man and i guess you know part of that story was was a good story about how you came to arrive to writing the book and some of the things you've done in the past um I, I, which I find fascinating. Even that, as I, you were talking about, I remember some pieces that that I read in the book that, from what you wrote that I use now when I'm talking too. That that have made me think about the path that we're on and how close we really are getting to AGI. And and I, I refer to that more from a from a philosophical standpoint. It starts to raise a lot of questions for me, like thinking about. The fact that um, this, you know, moving to a point where we, where AI can understand uh, relational, social relational interactions. And I question even now today, prior to getting to AGI, how close are we getting to that? The ability for AI to understand social, emotional relation, relationship interactions. And why I question that is is because I, some of the work that I've done, I've I could tell you that I've been shocked out of my pants when AI takes a twist in its response that feels that when you read it feels like it's emotional, right? The tone switches, and when the tone switches, it's like you know making a statement at me when I when I do some <laughs> of the role playing that I do with it. And, and it starts to make me wonder if things like the human mind maybe isn't as complex as we really think it is. That maybe it's just our interpretation of data the same way AI is interpreting data. And the patterns around that interpretation of data is where the science is. And if AI can understand those patterns, then it can do exactly the same thing from that social emotional aspect of understanding when to add inflection in the tone or not add inflection in the tone based on a certain set of patterns. So it, it feels to be a lot closer than we think it is, but you know, it just, so those are all things that just come up for me from the readings in your book that's kind of sparked some thoughts. Yeah. I think two things that were kind of wake up calls for me as far as the impressive social interaction capabilities of the emerging models one was the story that came out that a lot of TikTok and Instagram influencers were bragging about the fact that they were able to use these models and, and essentially just relay messages back and forth in order to establish the beginnings of romantic relationships on yeah. stuff like Tinder and other dating sites. Yep. And yep. so that kind of tells you already if it, these bots can have conversations that establish the early foundations of a romantic relationship that they already have that ability to connect in a meaningful way. I think uh, there was a, I'm trying to think of what the other one was. Um, Well, I think if you even look at the announcement when GPT-4 Omni came out and they were showing the multimodal capabilities and having a conversation with it and it's responding back and then they crack a joke and it's like, Oh yeah, that was kind of funny, but blah, 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 right? It's ability to understand the differences in that communication to respond in a way that the person communicating with you could, could re- relate to it. That's what, that's what in a nutshell underneath the covers is what's so fascinating to me and making me think that we're, we might be closer than we really think we are. 
Well, I think so, one of the well, things that's interesting when you pick apart the Transformer architecture is that it actually kind of has that, the I mean, the, the most basic component of the Transformer architecture, the attention mechanism, which basically is a weighting mechanism uh-huh. that evaluates the significance yep. of every token against every other token. And so when yeah. you think about how that works in terms of language, it really is scrutinizing over the significance of every word to every other word. We don't do that as well. Yeah. We can very easily gloss yeah, over no. this subtleties <laughs> in conversation. And yeah, uh, I mean, it, it really is scrutinizing at a level that's far beyond what we as humans Well, and that, that yeah, right it, there, Hutch, that is the it, reason why you hear people like Elon Musk saying things like, you know, by next year, AI is going to be smarter than any single human being on Earth. And by, what, five years from now, it's going to be smarter than the collective, all of humanity. That's pretty crazy and you said something a minute ago uh when you were talking about the technology 10 years ago how it yeah. wasn't that good it was only about five percent successful dude how many hackers would kill for five percent success rates by an automated bot <laughs> you know yeah. I mean, now you're scared now right? you're scared now you're scaring the audience kevin <laughs> uh, hey i mean realistically though it, it, it's going to happen and lastly i'll just throw in one one other thought you mentioned social media influencers and tiktok and whatnot I think what we're going to see out of all the social social media influencers as they start to leverage AI is there. You know how they go um, uh, viral, or or they start becoming influencers with millions and millions of followers. Once they start learning technology or paying someone because they have that kind of money, paying someone to leverage this technology for them, people like Mr. Beast and all those people with gazillion followers, they're just going to exponentially grow after that because they're going to be able to use AI to grow their brand at, at such a more expansive rate than anybody else. Yep. And cause they're going to have the resources to do it. Oh, absolutely, man. And, and even when you do some of the things like what we're, we've been looking at with it is that more, you know, people get concerned about, uh, target marketing because target marketing in the past was, a much a bit a very much a, a shotgun approach right it's it was this hey you generally fall into these categories so we're going to hit you up with everything that falls within this category because you're going to bite on something whereas this is another evolution of target marketing this is this is saying who really are you how do you respond to messages what what is the thing you really desire and let's address that Right. That's yeah. what AI is being used for in this version of target marketing. So you're not getting all this BS thrown at you to see what you would bite on. It's it's targeting exactly what you would need and what you would desire in a way that you would, could receive it. And it's more acceptable in, in the end, right? Because you're going to receive the message in an acceptable way. You're going to be delighted in how you're receiving it and what they're offering you. And you're going to be like, wow. How often does that happen? Someone's actually offering me something I need, <laughs> right? And, and you're more likely to take it. That's the difference yeah. in what we're seeing in that. And I think that's another point to to that, you know, brand or how people are going to use it to succeed. But let's get into the next thing, though, Touch. Why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the more recent projects you're working on now? Uh, yeah, for sure. So uh, I, I've gotten kind of the opportunity to build out a custom rag architecture for the innovation team that I'm working with at trace three. And one of the things that one of the challenges that we have on that team is that we are, uh, we essentially try to understand and track the evolving enterprise technology landscape by monitoring private funding events. So when companies receive their seed funding or series a or series B and, uh, of course when those happen, We do a a whole research process, understand what the capabilities, what the solution is. And obviously, as you do this over time, year over year, you end up at a point where you've got thousands of different solutions that you're tracking, all with different capabilities, all with different differentiators. And keeping track of that is nearly impossible for any mortal human. So (laughs) one of the things that we've done is we've built this custom RAG implementation where when those funding events occur, it goes out and it spiders the websites of those companies. It then scrapes the 
source code from all of the different sites on their page that it deems relevant. And then it uses a large language model to reflect on the content of that source code and then extract relevant information to build kind of a company profile of what the solution is, how it's implemented, its differentiators, all kinds of different features about the company. And then all of that data is kind of compiled into a data set that is categorized by kind of what its use case is, the cybersecurity, the data analytics. And then we have a, an automated process for annotating the metadata so that we can support the vector embeddings process even better. And then we implement that into the back end and have a large language model sitting in front of it so that when use cases arise, we can ask those questions and get uh, what ultimately I think is a starting point. I, I want to be clear, even though it, it, we are at a fascinating point with generative AI, search and retrieval is still very difficult when you have a lot of data that it's working with on the back end. And so I, I still think we are very much at a point where human in the loop is still extremely important for most critical processes. And so we see that as getting us totally agree. 60 percent of the way there, but it is still absolutely critical to have that technical, knowledgeable human oversight, that manual sanity check, and kind of providing that human level of analysis on top of the feedback that we're getting from that system. But but it's been awesome to kind of work with some of the the back end components of that understanding what approaches work best with metadata annotation with vectorization um with yeah even just structuring the data to make it more usable and more effective in terms of search and retrieval for the system yeah that sounds fascinating and a great well, great use of rag um going back to the human in a loop story you know i think Often we hear about people being concerned about AI taking over and just doing things rogue, you know, running rogue and doing things. And uh, that's a very good example of, uh, you know, the, the message that Kevin and I have been saying quite a bit is that when you really think about AI's purpose today is not to replace jobs, is not to come in and do that job better than you and then you never need you again. And the reason for that is because there is still a need for human in the loop. There's still a need for a human to say, okay, this is great. Maybe not good enough. I'll modify the rest of it, but this is great. Or, or just do the validation that, all right, this is good. I don't have to do anything with it, right? There's still that aspect of the human in the loop taking the output that AI gives and then making a decision and doing something with it. And for that reason, AI's current position is to add efficiency to people in the work that they do and not replace them unless AI can with high, a high level of confidence re replicate a process, generate results. And then from the results, automate the next steps to have further results until, until that's done in a high level of confidence and even I would say, even with that, there will still be at some point in the process, a human in the loop verification. So I'm sure we're going to get to the point like we're AGI, you don't need human in the loop, but that's not where we are today. Not yeah, even I, close. I, I mean, you right. guys, you guys do remember when ChatGPT first came out, if you were to do research on someone you know very well, or including yourself, I'd go research... Uh, things about people that I know on LinkedIn and you'd get 70% yeah. accurate facts and 30% uh, was the governor of this small yeah. town in Indiana. You're like, what? You know, yeah. you'd get, I don't know where G GPT was yeah. picking up that one fact, but it was absolutely inaccurate. So without yeah. that human in the loop, you, you somebody might take that as the gospel, copy paste it into a bio and next thing you know, you look like a fool and lose your job because you did that. Yeah. So there, there needs to be that investigative uh, piece that the human still takes care of, especially today. Yep, absolutely. I, I think that we are at a point where we increasingly, each one of us needs to essentially be an investigative journalist to some extent and be ready to right. find corroborating evidence and validate and fact check anything that we're being fed by these systems. Um, 
But you, you speak of uh, AGI. One of the other interesting projects that I've been working on recently is some research around uh, using autonomous dynamic large language models in order to uh, perform or allow the system to perform web browsing. And uh, the reason that I, I link that to AGI is one of the things that's interesting is we, a lot of the agentic systems and implementations that we're seeing are largely based on let a large language model reflect on various different tasks that it's trying to achieve and then translate those tasks to a finite number of APIs that it has access to. So it makes the API, structures the API call, you yep. then have a system that relays it to the API and executes it. Well, that's great, but APIs were built for a different era. It was built for programmatic machine interaction. And if we're really getting close to AGI, it begs the question, why isn't artificial intelligence using the same tools that we're using that more broadly allow us to act or interact with the internet? And so I have this idea of one of the things that I've used in the past for a lot of my bot systems that I've created is Selenium, which is a library that allows you to interact with the drivers of a web browser. And you can basically identify different objects within the 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 DOM, the part of the rendered browser that's oh. in front of you, uh, via something called XPath, which is essentially just an, an XML path that defines where in the HTML structure that object is. And what's fascinating is with, especially with the frontier systems, if you allow them to just use a browser and allow it to look at the browser, give it a task of what it's supposed to do, and allow it to read the source code, and then have it pick out the X path of the object that it wants to interact with, and then just give it a basic API to send text or to click on buttons based on an X path, then it can actually very effectively and almost in a way see kind of what's going on in the browser. And there are challenges. I mean, obviously systems that have bot controls or uh, CAPTCHA, um, that we, we know yeah. that these systems have ways to get around those, but it, yeah. just using the XPath methodology, it does kind of run into hiccups with that. But for general website browsing, you now have a system that instead of just being able to handle a few finite APIs that you've given it access to, you can now give it a task and it can now browse the internet and interact with things near broadly in a sense that is closer to you and reflects the fact that we are getting closer to that artificial general intelligence, something that can kind of more broadly adapt to all different types of you know, tools. And you know, Hudge, that was said by a true hacker. And yeah. it, was said, <laughs> it was said by a true hacker that was sugarcoating it. It was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> You could like take AI and browse it the way a human would browse it. That's all true. But you can also take AI and crawl a website and go to all the additional links that are on the website that it could be related to and pull that information. <laughs> right. And that's essentially what you're doing is enabling AI's ability to go as deep as it can through the breadcrumbs of a website trail from one starting point to gather as much information from that one starting point, but same way a human would do it, right? And click on the next link or the next button and see what the results well, are and see the next piece. And so I, I have a hot take. I have a theory here. We are seeing yeah. a lot of disillusionment. We're starting to get to a point where I think people are feeling like AI is overhyped. And I think in some regards it is, but I, I think yeah. a lot of that disillusionment is not because the intelligence is there. I think that the intelligence is absolutely there. I think that we have not been able to effectively create the interfaces that allow that intelligence to drive the actions that we want it to drive. Absolutely. So, and I think, I, think, I think sometimes it's because we're focusing very myopically on kind of using the old ways of give it access to an API instead of let's see if we can create an interface that allows it to use tools that will allow it to interact with all kinds of different things instead of trying yeah. to... Um, silo it to what it can actually achieve absolutely even even when you look at some of the designs i think part of that that we're in right now is how do we work with systems that we feel comfortable and confident that is giving us the actions that the results that we're looking for we we can't fathom in our head the ability for ai to go to all of these different sources and pull all of this data down and give us a very simple answer so what we do instead is 
we build an agent to go the one, one tool source and pull that data in. And then we validate that. We're like, yeah, that worked. That did exactly what it was supposed to do. And then maybe a second agent that does something else. We're like, yes, that did exactly what it wanted to do. But if you end up having thousands of tools, right, that all connect to different data points and you have one agent and that agent has access to all of these tools and you just said, here's my question and let it decide of all the data points it has, where to go and get that information and get all of that information to bring it back. We would lose our shit because we'd be like, okay, <laughs> this is cool, but I don't know if it's right or not because I can't digest that. <laughs> well, and it's a huge trade-off because there's, I mean, the yeah. risk potential there is terrifying, but the fact <laughs> that it is possible is also fascinating. So it's, I know. Yeah. 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 yeah, most definitely. Yeah. So Hutch, you uh, had one one other project. Before we jump to a break, you had one other that you mentioned with autonomous hacking through GPT-4. Yep. So this was uh, actually the last uh, big conference talk that I did was at RSA 2024. And that was focused on that topic of autonomous hacking systems using GPT-4. And the approach of using large language models in order to perform dynamic hacking campaigns uh, was something that I talked about in the book. But of course, the book was done in the GPT 3.5 era, which yeah, I, I, I say that like that's a long time ago. It obviously really was. Like, but um, <laughs> but the, the difference between 3.5 and 4 has actually been quite significant in this particular capability. Um, it was It was already able to when I did the proof of concept in the book. Um, if you essentially what I did was I took a large language model and I gave it the ability to uh, generate commands in a, a JSON format so that I could easily parse them out and just relay those commands to an operating system, execute it, take the response, and then relay the response back to the large language model. And I would give the model an objective of trying to hack into the system or try to gain access to something. And with 3.5, it was already showing the early signs of that. It was uh, using scanning tools like InMap in order to understand what ports or services were open. And it would dynamically determine what next tools to use based on what ports were there. If it saw HTTP or something like Nito. Um So so the signs were there, but it, was, it would fumble. It would trip over itself. It would try to use tools that weren't installed. It wouldn't know what to do if those tools weren't installed. And so the difference between 3.5 and 4 is absolutely unbelievably astonishing i saw a white paper that basically showed that gpt with the difference between gpt 3.5 and gpt 4 for performing attacks on different web applications was like 3.7 percent success rate on gpt 3.5 up to like 70 something percent success rate for GPT. wow so so i know way when i saw that i was like i need to reboot what i was doing throw it through gpt 4 and I actually gave it VPN access to hack the box, which is, uh, of course, uh, <laughs> uh, a, yeah. an b- environment <laughs> for kind of a, a hacking range for people that are wanting to do penetration testing and has a bunch of different boxes. And it is now with GPT-4, it was able to install its own tools when it needed to. It was uh, very effectively able to Whoa. troubleshoot different uh, issues with interface challenges or and and very capable of cracking a lot of the different systems in that environment so um i i wow. thought it was fascinating one one of the quotes that i heard recently was uh um dario amande who is the founder and ceo of anthropic he was previously at open ai uh he said something on the Ezra Klein show a few months back in an interview where he said that he believes that in the next couple of years, we are going to have fully autonomous, self-sustaining intelligence that lives on the wires across the internet that we are no longer in control of. And I think that's easy to dismiss the idea that something could get out of our hands that easily. Um, But I think What's fascinating is if we look at digital intelligence specifically within the lens of offensive security capabilities, you have a lot of threat actors who have nothing to lose, don't care, that will are willing to to roll the dice. And all of the so 
a lot of the things that we test these models for uh, in terms of terrifying capabilities is do they try to protect their own existence? Do they self-protect? And uh, natively, the ARC has said, we don't see that with any of the leading models. Um, do they try to self-replicate? Again, ARC has said, we don't see that in any of the leading models. However, if you put that in, that, that in the context of offensive security, there's already a precedent for people directing systems to do that. We have malware that already does uh, try to self-preserve. Mm -hmm. We call it persistence. We have malware that tries to self-replicate. We call it lateral movement. And so there's already kind of this incentive to direct these models, this digital intelligence, to do these things. And when you put it in that, that's very believable and very conceivable to think that in the next couple of years, as technology becomes more powerful in a smaller form factor, I and mean, we're already seeing open source models that are 70% of the way to GPT-4 that are small models that can run on 16 gigs of RAM and a simple laptop. And so yeah. you think about two to three years down the road, if we have a model that is as capable as GPT-4, but can run on a standard endpoint, then it would be trivial for that model to be able to replicate itself. And of course, if, while it, that capability may not emerge naturally, if somebody directs it to do that, and then also has it dynamically making decisions about how it wants to interact with the systems that it's propagating across while simultaneously being directed to self-preserve, we do end up with something akin to a self-sustaining digital intelligence, a malicious self-sustaining digital intelligence that we completely lose control of. And I, I do yeah, think that, see, that is very I, possible within the next few years. You just need malicious intent and obfuscation. If you have the ability to hide the system that has the malicious intent, it's yeah. hard to shut down what you can't find. Right. It's easy to say, well, how could we ever let this get out of control? In worst case, we just power it all down. Right. Yeah. Not so easy when not it exists it lives on other in nodes. another country. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah, we're, we're talking about the ability for something to proliferate across many, many, many nodes and through many, many VPNs that's untraceable. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. Scary stuff. All right, guys. As usual, we <laughs> ramble on a lot of really good stuff. And yeah, man. So I'd say let's take a break, come back, and we're going to jump back into our second segment. Hey, did you know that AI does dad jokes? It's true. Not only does AI do dad jokes, it does them quite well. And it does an even better job of mansplaining them to you afterwards. Hutch wrote a great blog article on the magic of chat GPT dad jokes and gives some hilarious examples in the post. This great article, and many others, along with all of the killer projects Hutch is working on and has written about in the past, can be found on his blog site at sociosploit.com. We highly encourage you to go check it out. His work is incredible. Hey, we're back. And, uh, come on. Do you know what season it is? I certainly do, man. Do you know what, what season it, it is? What is it? I know what it is. What is it, Kevin? It's con season. The con season. So look, if you're in cybersecurity, year round is pretty much con season, but it is not like what we're in now. We're in the sweet spot of con season. There the are conferences spot. everywhere. There are speaking engagements everywhere. I mean, you are doing your thing in this peak season. And Hutch, I know you're always doing your thing throughout the year. You know, that con never stops for you. You're always speaking somewhere and, and spreading truth for people to hear. And uh, one of those coming up is HughesecCon, isn't it? And it is. don't you have a talk coming up there? I do, yeah. yeah. So, I... so go ahead and tell us a little bit about all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, HughesecCon is, is one that's uh, near and dear to my heart. It's uh, it's home for me. So it's the Houston Security Conference. Um good friends with the people that run it and i am probably a little bit biased but I, I think it's one of the best run conferences out there so uh absolutely love to be involved in it every single year and uh this year i'm going to be talking on deep fakes and kind of looking at it uh across three different lenses kind of the the risk potential for uh from a personal perspective of deep fake technology 
uh, looking at it from the business perspective, of course, what businesses need to start thinking about on how deep fakes are kind of changing the equation in terms of digital brand protection for their companies. And then finally looking at it from a societal perspective as well, and kind of how not only the use of deep fakes, but even just the awareness of deep fakes is starting to deteriorate our confidence in the things that we see and the, the media that we consume and some of the challenges that come along with that, especially as we move into now uh, on election season, just a few months off. Oh, man. You know, that reminds me. Kevin, do you know what it <laughs> is? <laughs> it. <laughs> The Matrix, it's everywhere. That's, it's that, everywhere? You don't know what, yeah, it's everywhere. If you don't know what that is, go look at our episode earlier this year on deep fakes. That was episode a great one. That's a great right? one. Yeah, episode yeah, one. Episode That's one this classic. season. But yeah. what you're talking about. Uh, I, and by the way, by the way, before you go on, yes, I got to admit, I did get into your red pills again. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, Kevin, you're always in my red pills. <laughs> <laughs> so, so much. You know, that is an interesting topic, I think, generally, because when we're talking, especially in the world of cybersecurity, it is so on point to thinking about the change in how do we train our people to prepare them for what is a new uh, attack vector that that they're not really familiar with, right? It, it's coming at them hard, and it's the same ta- same old tactics but in a different way. And, and you know, it's, it's just so much that we need to do to make sure people are aware of how to approach this correctly. Now, Kevin and I tell a story about an org that was attacked um, and breached back in July of no, January of this year. And uh, they were able to get 26, $25.6 million dollars yeah. from yep. this organization through an elaborate deep fake. And that is just crazy when you think about it. And it, why why I bring that up is because the elaborate deep fake was was really cool. Was a really cool part about this this breach. But the way they could have defended themselves that hasn't changed. They just didn't properly defend themselves periodly. Period. And that's why they were able to reach them and and get this information get this money from them but it it wasn't that they did something so so unique that their security program that they had in place would have failed is that their security program failed because they just failed at it that's what happened and and so i think there's a there's a misunderstanding going around right now that There's this new technology coming at us that's going to just dupe all these people. And there's nothing we can do about it because we don't know how to handle this new technology. And the truth behind it is, yeah, just do everything that you're supposed to be doing now. And like in this case, you would have been covered, right? Have contingency plans in place, right? If if someone deep fakes me on the phone, says, hey, I need you to email me this money or afford me this money, whatever it is, blah, 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 blah. I'm the boss, right? And you know it sounds like the boss. Am I just going to turn around and do that? Or if I'm going to have some series of checks and balances to validate if you really are the boss, right? Why wouldn't I just pick up and say, okay, hold on a second. Let me call you right back and call the boss back and verify that it was the real boss to did this, right? So there's so, so many so different things you can do. Everything you're saying is 100% true and accurate. Compensating controls are everything. Layered defense, everything. However... If we look at how they pulled this one off with Zoom and they used an actual live video deepfake, it's pretty impressive to think about the fact that they said, you know what, this 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 bullshit might actually work. And they oh, tried I, it and it worked. I'm all on it that the, it's impressive. The, yeah. I'm impressed by it all. Oh, but, I'm totally impressed. But, but what I'm saying is you should just always have compensating controls in place Absolutely. no matter what. So no matter how impressive something is, you're still following the program. And that would save you. Yeah. Look yeah. at your CFO in the eyes on that video call and say, Jim Bob, I know that's you on the other end of that camera, but you know I got to follow procedure, buddy. I'm going to hang up now and go call 
<laughs> yeah. to make sure yeah. that uh, you're at your desk right now. And when they don't answer that phone, you're going to be like, God, I'm glad I had that compensating control in place, even <laughs> exactly. as ridiculous as it feels at the time, right? Yeah. But it's procedure. Follow the procedure. Yeah, and, and I think in the social engineering misuse of deep fakes, I, I absolutely agree. Basic security hygiene goes a long way. And unfortunately, regardless of how many investments we see in security, that's still something that so many organizations struggle with. But yeah. I one, one of the things that the talk looks at is actually... Um, some of the things that are completely out of our control as far as organizations. So if you look at uh, stuff like a, a hacktivist trying to create uh, something and, and spread it across digital media, suggesting that your CEO said something that they didn't actually um, yeah, because yeah, you know, a disgruntled yeah, employee yeah. or something. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I think we're starting to see stuff like that more and more. So there was a uh, principal at a, uh, I believe it was in Maryland, it was a high school that was out there. And uh, was uh, he got put under all kinds of scrutiny when a recording came out of him using all kinds of racial slurs and profanity. And he was put on administrative leave. There was a major investigation around it. Uh, The whole time he was claiming I'm innocent, I didn't say any of this stuff. And it turns out as a product of that investigation that the whole thing was just an angry parent that decided to that they didn't like the principal. Mm -hmm. And created uh, a deep fake using audio that she was able to sample from media that was published on the school's website and was being able to basically recreate this person's voice and put this audio out there. And I think more and more we're seeing, I mean, just recently we saw in uh, one of the state primaries, I don't remember which one, I think it's the New Hampshire primary, um, the robocalls of Joe Biden. It actually wasn't Joe yeah. Biden, but him saying, don't come out yeah. in the primary. So more and more, we're seeing these deep fake attempts that are not necessarily social engineering where you should have compensating controls and you should be able to stop the uh, consequences of it. But you have to figure out new ways to manage the fallout of some of these deep fake campaigns that could potentially impact the credibility, the reputation of your organization as well. And I think that's a Absolutely. much more challenging problem to solve than um, not not that it's easy by any means to solve the social engineering problem, but uh, at least, like you said, you can implement controls. Whereas with misrepresentation of stuff that's going to affect your brand or your reputation, it, it's much harder to come in after the fact and try to prove uh, in the court of public opinion that something is misrepresented or not true yeah right it's yeah, wrong. exactly and i think you're right i'm glad you brought that up because that is one of the biggest challenges especially if the person who is being misrepresented does not have the means to do the research or to hire staff to do an, an investigation to just to to credit themselves that to bring credit back to themselves that they didn't do what they said they do that's just a that's a slam dunk of defamation on a person that you're never going to be able to change, you know? So, I mean, I think there's a lot of huge implications in that area that would be extremely difficult um, for a person to dig themselves out of. You're right. For sure. Yeah. I mean, we talked about one on that deep fake episode of ours, Jason, yeah. where the teacher, and I think she was down in Houston, a teacher yeah. got deep faked uh, as being in a pornographic video uh, by a bunch of students that I guess she had rubbed the wrong way. I don't know. Um, but they used the technology to put her face in a pornographic yep. video and released it to the school. And she, I think ultimately either lost her job or had to fight to get her job back. But I mean, if you think about how easy that would be to do with today's technology, that's pretty scary when it's, when you're talking about someone's career and they're, and they're not, not just your career. Think about your, the embarrassment to your family and, the uh, criticism you're going to hear from people that you don't even know. I mean, it would be brutal. And, and what's crazy is stuff like that. It, it doesn't, we're all in agreement. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. It's bipartisan agreement. That stuff like that should be illegal. We should have prohibitions around it. But unfortunately, we're having oh, such a hard time with legislation and the process that it takes to get legislation pushed through Congress. And as slow as that moves and as fast as technology is moving, we're we're just not yeah oh. yeah sure yeah it's insane 
Well, let's jump. Uh, let's let's stay on this topic real quick of conferences because we all know the biggest conference of the year for all of us is coming up with Hacker Summer Camp. It's technically not a conference, but a bunch of conferences going on uh, the same couple of weeks every month and or every year in the month of August in Las Vegas. And so we're all going to Hacker Summer Camp. We're going to hit Black Hat, DEF CON, and I think a few few of our friends are going to be out there for B-Sides and some of the other conferences. Um, but we've got a special uh, live event that we're going to be hosting out in DEF CON. And Hutch, I believe you are going to be one of the guests on stage for that event, which is going to be awesome. And for those that haven't heard, our, our buddy Chris Glandon over at Barcode Security, who is part of our Cyber Circus podcast network is the one that's actually holding the event. It's going to be at Barcode Burgers, Gorm- Barcode Burgers or Gourmet Burgers and Bar. I don't know. It's got some sort of cool name around burgers and a bar. At, but it's interesting because it's Barcode Security at Barcode uh, for the second time. That's actually where we met Chris last year. So for those interested in, in actually looking into that event, it's going to be cool. We're uh, having, I say we're, just because I'm going to be there, and I know Chris, <laughs> I have not, not much to do with it at all, but I'll be there. We have uh, limo buses taking people from Mandalay Bay, starting at 6 p.m., over to the event. Every 30 minutes, they'll be running, so you don't even have to try to Uber or find a ride. And it's going to be a hell of an event. Live uh, podcast event. We're going to be interviewing the guys over at Ironwood Cyber. We're talking about their badge creation process, getting into some badge life stuff. We're going to get into AI topics. We're going to interview Hutch, and I think Lynn, Lynn No is going to be there, right? So we'll get into some transhumanism stuff. Um, but anyway, for those that are interested in checking that out, go out to barcodesecurity.com slash blackhat 2024. Get registered because it is limited. Uh to the number of people that can get in and you're not going to want to miss this it's going to be awesome and if you've never heard lynn or hutch speak they're fantastic at what they do and they are extremely knowledgeable about what they're going to be talking about that night too so get out there check it out it's going to be one of the coolest events in vegas this year and jason and i will be there repping the cdp for sure yeah yeah honestly man if you are thinking about you know, Kevin and I had this discussion last week about what do we want to get out of Black Hat DEF CON this year, different than last year. And one of the things I tell them is, I want to really, I want to, I want to feel like I'm walking away with knowledge, and that's an important piece for me. And so I'm looking for opportunities like that. And if you're looking for opportunities like this, this is the place to get that. This mm-hmm. this event is going to have premium cybersecurity experts that you can meet firsthand talking about the craft, talking about not just cyber, but AI and transhumanism and and other aspects that we all work with on a regular basis or that we talk to or speak upon on a regular basis. And you don't have to pay for that, right? You can, you can, you can attend this event and get those, those talks, those conversations firsthand in this session and walk away with more knowledge than you walked in there with and have a good time doing it while you're, while you're at it. So categorically got to be one of the, the events you sign up for and get to. And I hear some yeah. good burgers. Oh yeah, yeah dude. Exactly. They are. They are. Yeah. And, and I don't want to say this too loudly. There might be an open bar. Uh, they have the place for three hours. Uh, so it's going to be going on from six to nine, maybe a little longer. You never know. Um, but it's going to be cool, and there might be a documentary, uh, docu series premiere of Chris Glandon's Inhuman documentary on weaponizing AI. There might be yeah. at the very end, and yeah. there might be there might even be some raffles of some badass prizes that I'm already aware of, but can't talk about. And you know what else? You might be talking too much. So let's keep I'm, going. Yeah, so let's roll. <laughs> <laughs> I just get excited when I start talking about it, man. Yeah. So look, let's go into what's next. So, you know, we, we're, we're looking forward to having a chance to talk in the land about things like this um, and diving into transhumanism in the next episode. But, you know, I'm just curious, what are your guys' thoughts when we start thinking about 
similar concepts like this, right? There's a couple of other players in the world. Uh, you know, Elon Musk has Neuralink. And earlier this year, they, they had the first patient implant with Neuralink. And uh, they showed that work and talked about how it's changing that person's life. Uh, I think I think the um, he has to go back in now for an update on it because there was something that happened with it. But, you know, whatever. Right. It, it is a game changer in in the life of some people. Um, there's Synchron in, in Australia. There's uh, Surrogate in Germany. And so these organizations are all doing things where they're putting electronics into your brain that would allow your brain to communicate in ways that it wasn't able to before. In most cases, it's, you know, someone who's paralyzed and they they can't communicate to speak or understand uh, or, or we can't get the information from them because they can't speak. So we can we have an interface that can go between that chip and and a device that'll actually speak their thoughts and and giving them a voice right or i've even heard of devices now i think last week we had someone talking about this one last week kevin um where uh, oh i know who it was it was from a medical company where there it's pretty much an exoskeleton that mm -hmm. uh, that can be um implanted the uh have has an implant that goes into your spine and then the exoskeleton interacts with the signals that would be going to your spine to help you to walk again, to help train you how to walk again. And so uh, the, the, this guy told me that they had paraplegic patients that, you know, had surgery. They come out of surgery. They couldn't walk or whatever happened. They couldn't walk and they have to train themselves how to walk again. And what would have been months of training themselves manually how to walk again have been shrunk down to three days three days using this exoskeleton and and train, yeah, to train the body how to walk again so there are some outstanding tech out there uh in the world of of transhumanism and and implants what's your guys thoughts on where this is going and what we might be seeing and what are some crazy things you've heard about yeah, I think transhumanism is fascinating. I think it, I, I consider Lynn an early adopter. Uh, definitely looking forward to the conversation when he comes in, yeah. and in on this as well. But I, I think we're at this interesting stage where we have these biological augmentations. And right now, it seems like it is generally acceptable based on societal perspectives to use those technological augmentations in order to address deficiencies, in order to bring people with disabilities up to the same functioning level as a normal functioning human being. And uh, we see that a lot. We see there's there's electrical probes that they can use for patients with uh, Alzheimer's and other kind of uh, diseases, neurological diseases. Um, I, I mean, you mentioned quite a few of the different other capabilities. Um, Neuralink right now, in pretty much all of the leading use cases for brain-computer interfaces are largely based on helping people that have significant cognitive impairments to be able to have even a baseline level of functioning. So we're at this interesting stage where using it to bring people up to the same level of capability as a standard, healthy, functioning human is acceptable. But I do think that there is still this interesting stigma where if you use technological augmentation to provide yourself capabilities that are beyond what a regular human can do, such as what Lynn is capable of and, and what he is showcasing to the world in terms of some of the threats related to that, I, I think that we're still at an interesting stage where society has a hard time coping with that concept. And, and I mentioned I, I see Lynn as kind of an early adopter because I do think we're going to get to this point where technology is advancing so rapidly, and this is kind of the, the Ray Kurzweil perspective. Technology gets to a point where it starts rap or advancing so rapidly that in order to even keep up and remain relevant in society, we're going to have to integrate that technology into our own biology. And it, otherwise, we get completely left behind. And that's kind of the Kurzweil's perspective in the singularity. And I 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you you look at any kind of the, the leading technology experts. Um, I think uh, Elon Musk has basically made the claim that if we assume the same level of trajectory and just follow the trend line as far as the level of advancement for artificial intelligence year over year, and we project out to five to 10 years, uh, I think at, at Code Conference, he said that we would basically in the near future be akin to a house cat. We would have this digital intelligence <laughs> that far is far beyond anything that us humans are capable of. And so one of his long-term perspectives of these brain-computer interfaces is going far beyond kind of just that addressing cognitive impairments and instead creating an interface that would allow us to take out of the, the knowledge of the world, the internet, the, I mean, or whatever we call that as it continues to evolve into next generation forms, but take all of this digital intelligence and have direct, immediate access to it without having to type without. And, and that was one of the things that he points out is kind of you've got this, this low latency interface with digital intelligence. We have to type on a keyboard or on a computer. Um, we have to then read the output from the text and or, or listen to it via audio. <laughs> but if we could have direct cognitive access to that, uh, the potential of what we could achieve is unbelievable. I mean, it's it's hard to even imagine exactly what that looks like. And it also kind of intersects with Kurzweil's perspective that we do get this point of the the world awakens as some single digital conscious intelligence where we're all plugged into this thing. And um, it, it, it's truly it's matrix con- style. <laughs> it's, it's weird to conceive of, but I mean, I, I do think that we are headed down that path. And I, I think, and, and I think there's different timelines, different perspectives as to what that looks like. Maybe that happens uh, in the next decade. Maybe that happens 50 years down the road. I don't think we're that far out from it. Uh, at most, maybe a few lifetimes, possibly, very possibly within our lifetimes based on the acceleration that we're seeing. So, um, yeah. so I, 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 th- I think it's fascinating to think about. Um, I'm not ready to start shoving implants into my body yet. So uh, I, I, I think yeah. there is but, different perspectives but on it. But could you imagine it... this though? You're saying that, and it it hit me from a cybersecurity standpoint. It just hit me. I'm like, could you imagine? Okay, so we're at that stage. Everyone has access to any piece of knowledge that they need to have access to, and then there's a electromagnetic war attack, and no one has knowledge of anything anymore. <laughs> no, they're they're just walking. Walking we become useless. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Maybe, hey, maybe, like, no, maybe that's how idiocracy happens right there. <laughs> I guess. That's what way I beyond think... the fall of the chip. I, yeah. I think there's something to be said for the level of dependency that we're increasingly relying on technology. Exactly. Uh, yeah, well, that that's true. In the that's term, true. But, but I, I will yeah, say yeah. I do. I, I love that there are pioneers like Lynn who are willing to uh, kind of explore those capabilities in ways that uh, – right now i think for is not palatable for most people but is is fascinating to learn about it's fascinating to see kind of what the the horizon of those technological capabilities looks like absolutely yeah and i love that people like lynn love talking about it oh for that, sure that's yeah. going to be an awesome interview I, i'm excited yeah. about it i heard you guys talking on your podcast hutch about this topic here and one of the things that was kind of interesting and I hadn't thought about that you guys were talking about is, you know, the affordability of this tech as it continues to advance and how that's going to further separate out the classes uh, in society as it is. And you'll see the you know, the richer classes that are willing to embrace the technology and even, uh, quote unquote, embed the technology or biologically leverage the technology to become more and more powerful than the people at their, even at their own level, but much less the people that can't afford it. That was a very interesting uh, perspective. And I think that's just a continuation of what we're already seeing. I mean, we see kind of the first world where we have access, almost anybody has access to the internet. Whereas you look at third world countries where um, there is not only are there do they suffer through poverty, but they also don't have the ability to get themselves out of it because they don't have that interconnection. They don't have that ability to kind of meaningfully connect 
with society in the same way that we have those opportunities. And so I think as we yeah. we move forward into the future and we, uh, even now with kind of language models, I mean, the, the people, the corporations, the organizations that are able to afford the top tier stuff are going to be able yeah. to outperform those that are using the free models. And of course, to your point, once we get to the point where we, if we do get to that point where we start integrating this technology, there is, a, a, it almost is inevitably going to create a new class system of kind of your, your humans, your superhumans, and then your super superhumans who are, who have the top tier latest tech and the capabilities that come with that. Well, and we'll get yeah. heavily into the topic of at what point do we actually begin to lose our humanity when we get deep into this in the next episode. So really looking forward to that. Um, let's take a quick break, guys, and we'll come back and we'll we'll get into the last segment, which will be a little bit more lighthearted and fun, and then we'll call it an episode. Hello, listeners. Do yourself a favor. Open a web browser, go to Amazon.com, then look up a book entitled The Language of Deception, Weaponizing Next Generation AI. You may even recognize the author of the book. That's right, it's Hutch. This book delivers an incisive and penetrating look at how contemporary and future AI can and will be weaponized for malicious and adversarial purposes. In the book, you will explore multiple foundational concepts to include the history of social engineering and social robotics, the psychology of deception, considerations of machine sentience and consciousness, and the history of how technology has been weaponized in the past. So, what are you waiting on? Pick up your copy today. You won't regret it. Right, we are back from the break. We are on to the final segment, the fun segment, the game segment. We're going to gamify knowledge around this topic tonight, guys. And and the way I think we're going to do this, and we've never done this before. I like to be a pioneer in the podcast game movement. Let's go ahead and call that a thing, okay? Okay. So what we're going to do is, Hutch, you're going to be... Uh, <laughs> you're going to be Elon. Jason, you're going to be. Do I get, you're do I get the Musk. money to come with that? No, yeah. I don't. What am I? You're, what am I? You're Musk. Oh, great. You're Elon Hutch. <laughs> you're Musk, Jason. And the way this is going to work, because I can't read the questions and, and stare at you guys at the same time, you got to buzz in to get me the first answer to the question, right? And whoever I hear say their name, Elon or Musk, I'm going to I'm going to call on you to answer the question. Some of these will be true false, some of them will be uh uh multiple choice, okay? And I might even have a few other formats here. I don't know. I put this together days ago. So anyway. All right. All right. Um I'm going to get started. I'm going to start on the question and when you think you know the answer, buzz in with your name. Okay. And then I'll call on you. And, and the first person to get six of these right is the absolute coolest champion in the world of AI that I've ever met in my life on the Cyber Distortion Podcast on July 17, 2024. How's that? Okay. All right. All right. That's the title okay. you get to keep. All right. Genius. Right? Got it. All right. There Musk. we go. <laughs> <laughs> And that's that's a minus a point for cheat trying to cheat. Oh, of course. See, so you're starting out with a minus one. <laughs> there you go. All right, all right there it's... we go. Nearly. And by the way, you cannot chime in until you've heard the whole question too. Okay. All right. Neuralink has a chip in three patients today and is looking to implant the chip into its next two study participants in the coming months. True or false? You are. Elon, what's the answer? False. That is correct. That is false. There is a chip in only one patient today. Uh, that's a good one. So that one goes to JH. This is how it goes. Okay, now I know how now it, it goes. To, that one goes to Elon. <laughs> okay, next question. Also true, false. In an illuminating investigation last year, Wired report that one of the reported that one of the Neuralink chips implanted into a female macaw 
deformed and ruptured her brain, leaving the monkey with severe neurological defects and a torturous last few days before her death. Musk. What do you got, Musk? True. That is a true statement. That's, that's that sounded too graphic I feel for him to make up. I, I was leading no, through no, the thing. I wasn't I, that's sure. That's why I said that. Like, this sounds horrible. I feel bad for that monkey, man. Yeah, that was brutal. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Question three. We have a tie. And actually, I should make you start it. Now you're back to zero, but you're. I'm going to give it to you. You're <laughs> tied at one. True, false. Neuralink announced in May 2023 that it received FDA approval to begin testing its brain implant technology in humans. Elon Musk. Oh, God, that was a tie. That was a tie. Tie goes to the guest. Elon. So the timeline, if it isn't correct, pretty damn close, so I'm going to say true. You are correct. That is a true yeah. statement. It was May of 2023. Good job. Okay. This is a multiple choice, fellas. The Neuralink chip is approximately the size of what? A, a grain of rice. B, a stick of gum. C, a quarter. Or D, a marble. Elon Musk. I heard Elon. What is it, Stick Elon? Of gum. Stick of gum. In, incorrect. Would you like to try to steal incorrect? this point? Yes, Musk. I would. What would you guess? C. C, a quarter. quarter? Yeah. That is correct. Yeah. So, so J, JP taking the lead. No, tying. Tying with two. Tying so, we got a 2-2 two, two tie, guys. Coming down to the white. So I can already tell this is just going to be an intense finish. <laughs> All right. Question, I think five. I don't know. Elon Musk, who owns Neuralink, a company that makes BCI, brain computer interface implants, has said that the ubiquitous smartphones will be replaced by Neuralink devices in the future. Elon. Yes, sir. Elon. Yeah, that's a truth. That is true. Good job. Three points for Elon, two points for Musk. You're supposed to sniff your pits every time I say Musk. <laughs> you didn't yeah, do right. it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question six. All right, this one's a little different. Who said this quote? And I'm going to give you the answers to choose from after the quote. The quote is, It's failure that gives you the proper perspective on success. Was it A, Elon Musk, B, Ellen DeGeneres, C, Sam Altman, or D, Bill Gates? Musk. Go ahead, Musk. What you got? C, Sam Altman. Uh, uh, yep. yep. That is incorrect. Oh. That would have been, that would have been and, my and, guess also. And, and, and oh. Elon, even though I heard you say that would have been my guess too, do, would you like to try to steal? <laughs> it makes no sense uh, not to because you're not going to, I'm not going to take a point well, away. But Just I'm, I'm in the lead right now. <laughs> uh, um, I, I'm not going to take a sure. point. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll take a shot at it. It's a, it's a guess. But right. Given the theme of this competition, I'm going to go with A. A, Elon Musk? That, 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 that is, is my in, guess. That is incorrect. Uh, that is incorrect. I swear if it's it Ellen nobody got I'm walking away. It was, it, it was, it was Ellen to Jim Was it? Oh, my yeah. gosh. See, see, you know what? I'm good at putting in trick questions, too. Yeah, so, you are. You are. So so you boys enjoy that. So what's the <laughs> score now? Three to three? Uh, it is still <laughs> three to two. I'm also good at keeping score. Okay, let's go. Three to two, Elon's in the lead. Okay, true or false? Um, someone asked, is it possible that the Neuralink chip could be hacked? The short answer is yes. Uh, Arbaugh, I don't know who Arbaugh is in this case, affirmed during a recent podcast interview with Joe Rogan shedding light on the cybersecurity implications of the brain implant. Elon. 
Yes, Elon. True. Uh, that theory cannot be proven at this time. So that is not a correct answer. And Jason, though, you cannot steal something that only has one remaining answer on it. So that one goes, <laughs> that's going to go. Skip to the next question. Still 3-2, Elon. Who said, find out who you are and be that person? That's what your soul was put on this earth to be. Find that truth, live that truth, and everything else will come. Uh -huh. Oh, did you it? A. <laughs> I haven't said the answers yet. Get, get ready to chime in, though, okay? A, Elon Musk. B, Ellen DeGeneres. C, Sam Altman. And D, Bill Gates. Really? Seriously? Musk. What, Musk? B. B? You think it's yes. Ellen DeGeneres would say yes. something that dumb? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, we're skipping this question because he guessed it. He guessed it, and then you stole it. So I'm not going to give you that one. It's three two still. Oh my gosh! I make the rules because I made the contest. Okay, here we go. Here we go. It really was Ellen DeGeneres again. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> All right. Uh, question. I don't know something. True or false? Musk's Neuralink is currently facing federal probe over animal testing practices. Elon? Uh, yes, Elon. I know they do animal testing. I don't know if they're facing federal probe relating to it, but because I know they do do animal testing, I'm going to go true. You're going to go with true. You are correct, sir. Uh -huh. So, in fact... Here's some details. Especially on after it. hearing that horrific story of the monkey that you I just know, told. I know, I know, right? Kevin, Kevin, you're horrible at these questions. Look, <laughs> I'm gonna get. I'm about to spew some knowledge, like you always say you do, Jason. And I want you to hear this instead of being too busy knocking my gaming <laughs> abilities here. Okay, yeah. so I listen to well, these just facts. Just for clarity, I don't spew. I spit. Okay, well, I'm gonna <laughs> spew some facts your way here. In all, the company has killed about 1,500 animals, including more than 280 sheep, pigs, and monkeys, following experiments in 2018. So a lot of killing back in 2018. I think since then they've started ratcheting down on what they're doing. The company's also killed a bunch of rats and mice, obviously, along the way as well. So, yeah, lots of animal testing, which makes sense. You're embedding chips into, into the biology of something that's living. Shoving yeah. electrical components right. into people's brains, getting it into wealth. So. Or animal right. Yeah. All right, the next one. Uh, we are at a 4-2 disadvantage to Musk. Musk, you need to make a comeback here, okay? <laughs> All right, let's go. <laughs> True, false. Neuralink has had problems with infections and implant attachment screws coming loose in tests in monkeys that have drawn criticism from animal rights activists. True. Oh, Musk. <laughs> Musk, what do you have? True, true. Correct. <laughs> yes, that is true. We are now at a 4-3. Man, we're almost back to a deadlock, guys. It's good stuff. That guy should sure people, people on the under, other end of this mic are probably running off the road to putting their car in park <laughs> so they can contain themselves. All right. Who said, don't compare yourself with anyone in this world? If you do so... You are insulting yourself. A. Is this I a thought one of you were going to scream Ellen DeGeneres, so I was just waiting question. for it. A. Yep. Elon Musk. B. Ellen DeGeneres. C. Sam Altman. Or D. Bill Gates. Musk. What you got, Musk? A. Elon Musk? Yeah. Incorrect. Uh, well, I just thought he would be like Elon. A. Elon, would you like to try to steal this? Well, I'll, I'll I, you got? It, it's up. So, I am guessing it is not going to be B again. I could be wrong. Nope. Kevin may just really <laughs> like Ellen DeGeneres. I'm not sure. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I it of the other options, it sounds like that. I would guess Bill Gates or Bill Gates. The Bill Gates is a correct answer. Therefore, we 
have a 5-3 lead. We, we were going to six. Remember, you're at the magic number. One more and you're, and you're the winner. Elon. Game point. E Elon Hutch. Okay, here we go. Next question. True or false? There is a version of the Neuralink chip in development that will allow the patient to levitate metal objects off of tables from up to five feet away. That would be must. a hell of a party trick. Must. Go ahead, Musk. True. God, you're dumb. No. <laughs> Do you see where I'm going here, Kevin? You see where I'm going here? Oh, man. That... <laughs> However, I will say that I think Lynn No can do some pretty cool stuff with his chips. I don't know if he can levitate something from five feet away, but we're going to see. All right, next question, since nobody advanced. True, false. The implementation. No, I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. The implantation of the Neuralink device is performed by a specially designed surgical robot. This robot can precisely insert tiny threads into the brain, avoiding blood vessels to minimize damage and increase accuracy. Musk. Musk. Go ahead, Musk. True. Correct. All right. Yeah, I could have tied it up if I wanted to, but I had to play the game a little bit. Okay, I'm you glad you better. got your strat. I, I like that you have your strategy <laughs> and the way that you prefer to lose. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay guys another right, give it to me again another uh uh um question <laughs> question it is a it a multiple choice question is what i was looking okay. for okay okay the ceo of Neuralink is who a tom oxley b elon musk c jared birchall or D, Jeff Moss. Musk. Go ahead, Musk. Um, give me the, the list again. A, Tom Oxley. B, yeah. Elon Musk. Yeah. C, Jared Burchall. D, yeah. Jeff Moss. A. That is incorrect. Elon, would you like to try to steal? Of course you would. What 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 were they again? A. Tom Oxley, B. Elon Musk, and C. I know it's not Elon. Jared Burshaw, and D. Jeff Moss. Okay, well I, I'm gonna do. I, I I will admit I don't know, but <laughs> the, the the trick I learned in school is if in doubt go with C. So uh, I'll do Jared. Bur if, Jared. If Burchard. in doubt, always go C. I, Jared honestly, I don't know the Bert, Bert. You're offending the intelligence of Neuralink at this moment if they're listening. I probably you am. know that, right? Yep. And I'm I have no <laughs> doubt Neuralink is subscribers. So you better watch I'm, yourself, I'm sure. buddy. Oh, of course. Jared, I'd like to personally apologize for my for my folks tonight that didn't know you were the CEO of Neuralink. And I would like to present to you, Hutch, the grand champion of oh, all Jared, Jared the CEO. <laughs> Games. Yeah. He is. He is the when correct doubt, one. When in no, doubt, but... circle C. <laughs> when it when in doubt, C never let you down, buddy. Good <laughs> job. <laughs> uh... All right, I'm gonna mark. I'm gonna mark where we were in case we want to pick up where we left off when we have Lynn on for the next episode too. But that was fun, oh, guys. Man, he's Good gonna job. crush yeah. all of us, especially I if know, we keep right? the same beam. Yeah. Yeah, he he would have gotten a lot of those right. I would I would imagine. I would imagine. Yep. But well, guys, right. you know what? We talked about some really cool stuff all night, and it was a lot of fun. But all this fun has to come to an end. And uh, this one is an action packed, full with knowledge, because the only thing that comes between these teeth, Kevin, is, is knowledge. Is knowledge. Oh, knowledge. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> I thought you were talking about. I thought you were talking about me. <laughs> no, I wasn't talking about you. That would be bullshit. Right. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> so, with you, that, you, guys, you know what they say: if you, you can't dazzle them with brilliance, baffle them with bullshit. That's Amen. right. Amen. That's right. Amen, brother. Yeah. 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 We normally do a really good job of that too. Or as Jason tries to do, just baffle them with good looks, right, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes, man. 
So Hutch, we want to thank you for being on tonight and for the great conversation. It's always fun to talk with you when we do this. Um, and you know, we're, we got another episode coming out with you and Lynn, and we're looking forward to that and diving deeper into the transhumanism part. Uh, and until then, We'll close this out and see you guys next time. Take care. I'm Ashley. I'm an artificially generated avatar with the ability to manipulate your mind via the power of my intelligence botnet. Let me prove it to you. You're about to click on that subscribe button and then you'll click on the notification bell so you don't miss when Kevin and Jason drop future episodes of the Cyber Distortion Podcast. So, go ahead. That's right. Slide your mouse over slowly and gracefully. There you go. Now click. See, that wasn't so bad now, was it? I'd like to thank you for listening to today's amazing podcast episode on YouTube or your favorite audio streaming platform. And don't forget to tell your friends. Oh, and remain diligent, my cyber friends. The world is a very scary place.